to Lunch and Learn on Thursday, May 13th. We're going to wait just a couple minutes until everybody's able to join us. Hope everyone's able to enjoy the weather today. It's warmer than expected. It's not fall today, which is also wonderful. All right. It is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague from Warren County Public Schools, Gina Casella. She is an OT, autism specialist, guru, passionate person about sensory needs, and I am so excited um, to have you here today to present this very important topic. So without further ado, we are going to let you roll. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for, well, thank you for the introduction first, and thank you all so much for giving up your lunch hour to learn a little bit more about sensory needs, um, both in the classroom and at home. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of what we're going to cover. Um, the first that I'm going to go through is why, and we'll talk about that. Um, then I'm going to give you a list of some specific observations of sensory behaviors. And then we're going to talk about what sensory system those behaviors are likely tapping into. And then we're going to go through suggestions for replacement behaviors. Um, and I do include ideas for adults and include ideas for children um, because everybody does get older and we need to have thing, things that are age appropriate um, but still meet the needs. At the end, we're gonna have time for discussion and questions. If you guys have questions during it, feel free to ask. These guys have a monitor on here and they can you know, interrupt me at any time. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I do have a disclaimer at the bottom. So we're gonna talk about sensory systems and I'm gonna say, hey, you might see this that is probably this sensory system. It doesn't mean that it's just one sensory system at work. Um, there could be multiple reasons that an individual is doing a specific behavior. So we will discuss them as far as like individual, but please understand it could be a combination of things going on. So that's my little disclaimer to put out there. The first thing I wanna talk about is why. Um, why is the individual doing this behavior? Is it something going on in the environment? Are they overstimulated by something? Are they understimulated by just their general self and they need to try to increase their alertness so that they can engage in their environment? Um, you can see these kind of things if it's a busy environment, if there's a distinct sight or a smell, like those things all contribute to the why. Why on the person's end? Um, the other thing that I want you to consider is why do you want to replace the behavior? We all engage in sensory behaviors all the time. Sitting right here with a fidget in my hand as I'm talking to you on the phone, I'm sitting in an adapted chair, okay? Both of those things are fine and normal and we don't need to change any of that. Um, so I, I really want you to ask why, because you may observe things, but if you're looking at functioning within a classroom, students, pretty much ignore that stuff. You know, they have grown up with individuals with autism in their classrooms, and they're probably not going to notice these things as much as you do. So when you're looking at that, just ask yourself, is it in interfering with that person's ability to engage? Because it might. Um, is the behavior interfering with their interactions with other people? Am I doing something that then impedes my ability to actually interact with somebody else? And the third thing you can consider is, I can't read my notes because the thing's on the bottom. Uh -huh. Is the behavior interfering with other individuals in the environment? So is it bothering me? Is it impacting my ability to engage or is it bothering other people? Um, and unless it's, if all of those questions are no, then you don't need to do anything about it. Just like let them roll and let them do the sensory behavior they're engaging in. All right, but say we decided that we're seeing some things. So here's the first thing that you're gonna see, right? So you see that a student or an individual is rocking in place. They're sitting in a chair, they're rocking. When they get on a swing, they might go with crazy intensity and they're hitting it to like the high ends of the swing and going back and forth as much as possible. They might twirl or spin in place. Um, all of those things are something that you would see in an individual that is seeking out sensory input. Um, 
avoiding in this particular sensory area would look like avoiding changing your head position in space. This would be a student who has no interest in getting on a swing, who doesn't want to get on any surface that's uneven that would tip their balance. It's any resistance to their head changing position in space. So the system that we're talking about is the vestibular system. Um, again, first question, why do you need to provide an alternate? Keep that in your head. Every slide and every sensory system that I'm going to go through, that is my first, first bullet on every one. Why? Okay, because I really want you to put that in your head. Do you need to change it? Um, replacements for that are having a rocking chair or a swing that the person can use. You can use those pod chairs, which are very much uh, more socially appropriate as you get to like middle school, high school, and up to adult, adulthood. Um, those things are available for homes. They cost like a hundred bucks. They're not expensive at all. Um, you can use a swivel stool and then they can get some rotational mov movement in if that's the twirling that they're doing. You can also use something like a balance board and balance board is a very technical therapy tool. Um, but people more often know like a hover skateboard, they can get on a hover skateboard and then they can kind of get that same thing. And again, maintain being a little bit socially appropriate. So those are some ideas for the vestibular system, not an exclusive list, just some general ideas. Okay, so the next one, I'm gonna show you the cutest kid in the entire world. He's one of mine. <laughs> that is my son, Connor. He has been stimming like that his entire life, <laughs> whenever he gets excited. So you probably heard me at the be beginning say, all right, do it. Um, we talk about that at home all the time. He gets excited about something and the first thing that he does is put his hands up here and he flaps. Um, so you guys may very well have seen that in different individuals. I talk to him about it at home and I'm just like, okay, why are you flapping? What's, what's got you excited? <laughs> and, you know, we'll have that conversation. It's not something that I've done anything about. So again, do you need to do anything, right? Um, so in this system, there are seeking activities that you will see. <clears throat> turning lights on and off repeatedly or just turning it off and leaving it off. Um, flicking the fingers by the eyes. And so that was kind of the video that he was doing. Uh, spinning objects or parts of objects and doing that really close to the face. Some things that you would see if someone was avoiding um, would be the closure of the eyes or the squinting, kind of putting your head down and covering your eyes, turning off lights and avoiding space with fluorescent lights. I really want you to pay attention when you're working with individuals with autism on hallways. Um, from a behavioral standpoint, and we're not talking about behavior today, but um, from that standpoint and observations, you might enter into a hallway that is like a white hallway. You've got light colored walls and you have the white floor and those fluorescent lights and it's just long. And you'll see a glare that's all over the surfaces. That can be really difficult for individuals with autism. And you may see the behavior that the student wants to run down that hallway people typically say, okay, that's escape or avoidance. Well, not necessarily. It could be overwhelming in that environment because of that glare, it's a lot of visual input and visual information going on. So consider that um, when you're working with people and you see that behavior. Um, so what could you do about that, right? All right, so what are our options after we decide that yes, we need to provide an alternative. Um, you can use shaded or colored glasses. You can just have regular, you know, sunglasses or they come in different shades and different colors. You can use that. Um, that is if somebody is avoiding visual input. If somebody is seeking it out, you can use light strands or bubble tubes. Um, and either one of those things, yes, there is all that snoozling and um, those sensory pieces that you can get off of medical type websites. However, um, what I have used as a less expensive alternative is my friend Amazon and we're buddies. <laughs> and you can get the light strands that you can use to illuminate a car or a bedroom. 
they actually come in packs of like 80 strands. And so then you can lay them on the floor and somebody could pick them up and move them around. And they're much cheaper. They're like $60, something like that. Um, so you can look at light strands. Another thing that you can do to help support, especially in a situation like in my office here with the fluorescent lights is use LED lights um, and substitute those out. In schools, we often have the fluorescent lights. So what we will do in classrooms where students have, have difficulties with that is just leave those lights off and have lamps around that have LED lights and illuminate enough for us to see. Um, another alternative is wearing a hat or a visor, which can sometimes just block the light enough. Okay, so the next sensory system we're going to talk about, you would see seeking behaviors that would include banging items on surfaces, um, playing really loud music, generating sounds in any way, whether it be like clicking, tapping, um, anything like that, humming, singing. <clears throat> In avoiding, you might see them covering their ears or having self-generated noises like humming or singing. I did just point out that that could be a seeking behavior or it could be avoiding behavior. Um, and that's just something to note. So you see what's going on and you acknowledge the fact that it could be either and you need to do a deeper dive into which one it is. Individuals with autism will try to control if there's a, a an environment that they're in, in which there's a lot of auditory sounds coming in, specifically classroom, a restaurant, um, a store, something like that. And they cannot predict this just dropped over there. Somebody just pulled this. I hear this cart coming down the hallway and that's a really loud AC. So all of that might be happening. And then, oh, also by the way, like I have these reflective surfaces that are coming at me that I just, it's just driving my eyes crazy. So in all of that, I might hum or sing to myself so that I can block out all of that auditory input that I'm hearing and I can control it because I hear it. Um, so humming a lot actually is, is one of the replacements that you'll see for that. So after we determine we need an alternative. So we look at replacements. There could be earplugs. You can get the little ones that you can use for um, any kind of a work site and you can put those in. There are ones that are reusable ones that you can get. Headphones are definitely appropriate, uh, especially if you're looking at a middle school and up student. Um, headphones are quite appropriate. You could use the noise canceling ones or you could actually have headphones that can be used with, with music or calming sounds or something like that. Um, and the next thing that I have on here, I put it as an ear flap hat. Hope, hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. It's called a Yushanka. It's like a Russian hat. So, you know, it's that hat that comes across and has those ear flaps that come down over the ears. That can also just help kind of muffle all of the sound that's in the environment and can assist people when auditory is bothering them. Um, also playing instruments and playing drums in the piano, that can be calming to certain individuals. Um, so don't leave that out because that is them being able to control and predict their environment and create the sound themselves, which can be calming. So the next sensory system that we're gonna talk about, um, in seeking, people will have heavy steps and they might bang on surfaces. Sound familiar? Very similar to what I just said in auditory. So again, like I said at the beginning, it could be multiple sensory systems being played into. Um, so they might be banging on surfaces, pushing hard on items, breaking pencils is a big one, and just pushing too hard. So if you're in an academic environment, you might have somebody who has like really heavy pencil pressure when they're completing assignments and like maybe they're ripping the paper and or if they go to erase something like they can't erase it because it's so thick with how they actually applied it. Um, you could see toe walking. Toe walking is not, toe walking could mean many things, but it could be here that would be some seeking sign. Um, also jumping or bumping into walls, like as they're going down the hallway, that long hallway that has those reflective surfaces, I might be bumping up against the wall every now and again because I need that input. In avoiding, which is really rare, um, but it does happen, it is avoiding hugs and avoiding he heavy pressure. Now, 
avoiding hugs, again, could be multiple things. It could be an issue with the sensory system or it could be something completely different. Um, most people find this sensation to be calming. It's rare for it to be bothersome, um, but we are talking about the proprioceptive system. So big, huge word. What does that mean? Um, proprioception is information from your muscles and joints. So there are these receptors inside. And when you apply pressure to your muscles and your joints, that taps into that system. So you can do that by pushing and pulling objects. You can also do that by carrying heavy weight. So replacements, weighted blankets, those are great. Um, weight, some people use weighted vests, that works too. And to make those look appropriate, we have done, you know, vests that look like fishing vests and, you know, you put weights in those. You can have a book bag that you put additional weights into. And so that again, helps to look like something typical, like everybody's doing. Um, wearing smaller spandex clothing. So Under Armour is great. And I'm super excited that they exist because they have that tight spandex material. So if you wear a shirt a little bit too small for you, that provides you with that hug like all day long. Um, there are other things like compression vests, but you would wanna use uh, an occupational therapist to assist you uh, looking at that one. So I didn't put it on the list because I don't want people referring to that one outside of guidance from an occupational therapist. Um, other things could be heavy work, carrying objects from one place to another, um, actually doing weightlifting. Again, we talked about what's the adult activity look like for this weightlifting and doing any kind of weightlifting on a regular basis, like doing that once or twice a day, that's going to provide that input and have a calming effect. Um, placing weight on or in items. We talked about that jumping jacks or jumping rope also gives you that compression information. Uh, donkey kicks, all right? People are probably gonna say, what is a donkey kick? Um, you put your hands on any surface and you kick your legs backwards. Um, it's something that we like to do with our younger folks, you know, elementary school age students that usually works out for them. Um, chair push-ups is the same as, you can use that at any age. You go back, put your hands on your chair and you dip down. Some people call them chair dips either way. Um, and apparently there's weightlifting. I already mentioned it out of place. So the next system we're gonna look at, um, seeking in this system looks like rubbing be objects between your hands. So they might pick something up and like sand and kind of rub it and go like that between their hands with rocks, with gravel as you're taking a walk. Um, eraser bits are popular to pick that off and then kind of pull that apart until there's nothing left. Um, picking up objects and dropping them repeat, repeatedly. In avoiding, you would see somebody who doesn't want to touch messy objects or shaving cream. Um, they won't use their fingers to eat. So there are times and foods that are appropriate to finger feed, but they will avoid that at all costs. Um, and you'll definitely see that messy object thing more so in like an elementary type student. Um, avoiding those fun activities that we like to do in elementary school. So the system that we're talking about here is tactile. Tactile means touch. So again, why do we need to provide an alternate? I'm sitting here still fidgeting with my rock. Um, but if you do, let's do that. So replacements, kinetic sand, this stuff is super cool if you've never seen kinetic sand. So it looks exactly like sand, but you can move it and actually shape it into different things. The reason I like that over just regular sand from anywhere else, regular sand from everywhere else gets everywhere. This kind of like sticks to its own um, and it does come off your hands quite nicely. So kinetic sand is definitely cool to use. Um, younger people, you can do shaving cream activities and you can do fidget rings. I have jewelry that I own that are just three rings that are intertwined. And if I get in a situation where I'm nervous or I just need to have that outlet, I'll just move the ring up and down my finger. Um, so there's that jewelry. And you can also have textured clothing or pants. Like some individuals like to have um, pants that either have like, I'm gonna say bejeweled, 
thank you, I just acknowledged my age, but <laughs> have the little jewelry things on them or ones that are embroidered because the feeling of that, if they rub on the like top of their pant leg and that has that, that could be very, very calming. Another situation that you could do is underneath the desk, putting Velcro either side of the Velcro underneath the edge of the student's desk, then they can just run their fingers back and forth over the Velcro and have that um, input. Another thing is pebbles. I noted that I have one rock. I have a little container full of pebbles. And so you can just play with that. Um, Zen gardens also work very well if you're looking at an adult. The next sensory system is when you are observing this, you would see somebody inhaling scents. Um, most commonly, I will see individuals that will come up to someone, lean in and be like, and then kind of back away. Um, smelling hair is a big thing and, and coming towards somebody and like smelling the scents from their hair. In avoiding, you would see refusal of an individual to enter a space. Um, you know, they might come around and start to go and just back up and withdraw. Um, they might cover their nose and sometimes they might gag. This system that we're talking about is the gustatory system, which is smell. Um, again, why do you need to provide an alternative? This one, if we are looking at avoiding, it's definitely very helpful. And thank you, COVID-19, for making face masks cool you know, and giving us different designs and options. That's fabulous. Um, so if you if you have somebody who's avoiding different scents, they could put on a face mask. Um, that's one option. Other replacements that I've used in the past are providing different scented lotions um, or perfumes and colognes. Looking at the opposite end there, if somebody is avoiding and they don't like those things, if you're their classroom teacher, avoid putting on scented lotions and perfumes or colognes. Um, that is very helpful and supportive for those individuals. If you happen to have a classroom that usually has a Glade plug-in, if a sense of smell is an issue for somebody, you might not want to have that in your room. Um, alternatively, if they do enjoy those things, having that in your room is helpful. Um, aromatherapy, you can use essential oils and an individual can pick what scent um, they would like to have. Another thing that we've done is Vaseline under the nostrils. So like right here, you can put Vaseline and it kind of helps to block. I've also had individuals that will put a little bit of toothpaste right here. Um, and usually those are individuals who then cover with a mask as well. Um, but toothpaste has definitely a distinct minty smell. Um, so kind of putting that underneath there is helpful. Uh, allowing people to um, allowing people to like that sour, spicy, minty, bitter, that's not supposed to be there. That's supposed to be in my oral slide, which is coming up. I'm gonna remove that later. <laughs> um, but with the minty, like I said, you can put a little bit of toothpaste underneath the nostrils that can help. Okay, so the next sensory system, looking at the wet neck of shirts, so you'll have, you'll see an individual that this part of the shirt is wet. It's usually like wrung out a bit, um, wet sleeves on their shirts. You might see some drooling, um, mouthing of items, different objects, chewed pencils. That can be an intense one. Um, some individuals will like to actually chew the metal piece of the pencil and to the point that it comes off and they might actually crack the pencil itself. Um, in avoiding, you might see an individual who has a very picky appetite. They only like certain textures. Um, this can be a sign like you can see this. It might be a clue of having an issue if you have an extra long use of the bottle um, or pureed foods. It's not always the case. That's a complex area. There could be lots of things going on there, but one of them could be avoiding the input in this area. And so the area that we're talking about is oral. So that's having to do with your mouth. Um, the replacements can be kind of fun, actually. Um, so replacements for this one 
like I said in that earlier slide, and I'll move that down, but that is looking at your sour, your minty, um, any of those specific type of um, tastes uh, that that might work out. I had one student that I used to work with who absolutely loved hot sauce. So we would put Frank's hot sauce on everything. It was kind of her reward um, to do different activities, you know, because she just loved Frank's hot sauce. That was her, that was her area. That's what she wanted. Um, thick beverages. So if you have an individual who has oral seeking behaviors, drinking a milkshake out of the straw, very helpful. You can add thickener to different liquids, um, but you can also use a smaller straw. And that could be using a coffee stir with like a regular beverage. It just requires more oral action to be able to drink that. Um, you can increase the texture. Pretzels and nuts, so you're getting that crunchy texture. You can increase the resistance of what people are chewing. So you could do now and laters or starbursts gum is kind of like in the middle there depending upon how many pieces you're chewing what kind um, there's also awesome jewelry at this point so you guys have probably seen like the dinosaur necklaces and things that they have come out with for younger folks um, those are excellent options there are also things called chewy tubes which uh, they, they say they are indestructible I will say that I've seen them be destroyed, <laughs> but um, chewy tubes are an option. And then I did mention something on here that's called a Z vibe, and that is intense stimulation in the mouth. Again, I would consult with either an occupational therapist or a speech therapist related to using that. Um, it's definitely a very intense uh, way to take care of this sense. And then we also have crunchy, chewy, mushy, or any combination of that just to stimulate um, oral sensation. Oh, so that is the end. Apparently I did that quickly. Um, so do you guys have any questions? Again, I just kind of went over general observations that you're going to see and some of the suggestions, but there is definitely, it's definitely not an exhaustive list. Yes, Gina, thank you so much for um, just giving all that information out. And I'm glad that we have some extra time right now to go over some questions because I think we're going to see a few rolling in here. So go ahead and add those to the chat. And I'm just going to scroll back up to the top and kind of give you an idea of what was happening in there while we were while you were presenting. But um, uh, really was kind of talking about um, copies of the slides. I put the link in the chat so that you can get the slides and also we'll post the um, recording from today out on that archives page. Um, the idea that we all have sensory inputs we are seeking and avoiding. Just everyone can can really see how that plays into everyday life. Uh, somebody mentioned that they have cloud shades that cover the lights in their room. Is that something you've seen before Gina? Yes, yes, we actually have them here in our office. So you can get different types. So there's, there are, when you have the fluorescent lights and you have that plastic cover, you can actually purchase other plastic covers that come in different designs. Um, I've seen clouds and flowers and just really pretty things, some that look like water. Um, all of those are great. You can also purchase these covers that it's a fabric um, that has magnets along the side and that can kind of drape over the light. Just one morning there, you wanna make sure that you put the fire retardant spray on that prior to putting them up or buy the ones that are fire retardant um, because that is a, for us in the schools, that's definitely an issue that needs to be the case. Um, and just from a safety standpoint, that's good anyway. Um, but both of those things exist and they are excellent ways to kind of like filter out some of that fluorescent light. Great, yes. Um, and somebody was asking about any ideas you might have for intense hand clapping. Ah, uh, okay. So if we're looking at hand clapping, a couple of questions I would ask. What types of activities? Is there any consistency to when they're in, engaging in that STEM? Um, and if there is, then kind of look at, at giving them, because it could be auditory or it could be proprioceptive. So you, you want to try to tap into either system and figure out which one. But um, first I look at schedule and seeing if it is at a consistent time, because if it is, 
then I want to give the sensory input to replace just prior to the person actually engaging in that activity in their schedule. Um, and then you can replace it with different things. So we're hand clapping, we're getting that, that um, input there. So is it something that we can do and allow the student to do drums? Um, can we put them on a ball and allow them to just kind of sit on the ball and smack the ball and see if that will give them that input? That would be from the proprioceptive standpoint and trying from that angle. If it's a sound, then you can try to do headphones, like record them doing that and give them headphones and an iPad so they can see and hear. And maybe it's just the sound. Uh, it could be both. <laughs> and if it's both, you might just want to allow them to have time to do that prior to whatever activity they engage in and see if that helps to decrease it. Great ideas. Um, here comes another one. Um, what would you suggest as a replacement behavior for tearing paper? And the reason for it needing to be replaced is because it's school property, such as books and other things like that. Gotcha. So I've had that one before. Um, I was able to replace that by allowing them to tear paper that we didn't care about. <laughs> um, and we kind of started with that. Um, and, and that student just then continue to tear paper. That was the sensation they wanted. Um, we had tried to replace it with, okay, can you cut paper? Can you do? No, it was straight up. I want to tear paper. Um, so for us, we gave them things that didn't matter. And we they left. had like a bin or something that was okay for them to get into to tear? Yep. Okay. yep. And again, looking at timing. So we all have these things that we need to do to regulate our system. So it's perfectly acceptable and fine. We just need to kind of schedule it and, and working with the student on scheduling that. Uh, so yes, I would look at if there's any consistency as far as what activities they get into when they really need it or a time of the day, because it can be either. And if it is, hijack that, jumpstart and give them that opportunity, give them that bin to actually rip stuff. And so you might have either old textbooks that are around that nobody needs anymore because now we're doing online stuff, you know, find things that that are okay for them to to go ahead and tear. I've, I've found that when I've had that one in the past, we work ourselves out of that. Like it's a, a time period where we want to do that and then we move on. A replacement mm -hmm. for that sensory need. Okay. Um, any ideas for the child who eats mulch rocks or Play-Doh? Yes. Okay. So this is tricky because you could look at, yes, this might be an oral sensory stimulation thing, or we could be looking at pica. So if it's pica, I can't give you anything from a sensory standpoint. It, it is, it's a medical condition. Um, if it is an oral thing, and if they're doing, like you said, rocks and other hard things, in my head, I heard hard things. So I would, I would look at replacing that with um, like rock candy or, or pretzels, um, something that's going to have that jawbreaker or whatever. Yeah, jawbreaker. And like, but again, when you're looking at that, okay, so then two issues come up. Number one, it's a lot of sugar. Number two, if we are crunching these things, there's damage to our teeth. We're already damaging our teeth. So we kind of have to like pick our battles. If you choose, um, if you choose like the rock candy, it's going to give before like a pebble would. So it's going to be a little bit healthier for that. Um, but the sugar thing does tend to be a concern. Uh, and so you try the pretzels and other hard stuff like that. Great ideas. Okay, let me see. I got lost in my thing as I was listening here. Oh, um, suggestion for any replacements to hair smelling? Ah, so usually we have to replace the hair smelling because a lot of times that aligns with head butting. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've had that align. If that is the alignment, I have worked with people on asking smell why can't I please right now? Smell, please, um, is how I've worked with students on differentiating whether they were going to headbutt me or they wanted to smell my hair. Um, but something that I've done alternately is allowing them to, uh, we've gotten um, doll heads. We actually ordered like hair, a head of hair, like you would get if you were in cosmetology, cos, 
dermatology school. And we've sprayed that with different scents and let them smell that instead. Um, that can be like a phase out, but you can also get the different essential oils. They have the little pads that come with you when you put it in jewelry. And so you can add that, whatever scent it is they're seeking. Um, Typically, I've had students that have kind of gotten real interested in individual people. So it's kind of more like their shampoo um, or their hair products. So you can actually try to put that on the little pads that come for those jewelry things and see if yeah. you can kind of replace it and phase it out that way. That's a great idea. Um, the next one is pacifier habit and stop and to maybe stop mouthing everything. Mm -hmm. So another excellent questions, people like you guys are rocking it. Um, so yeah, very diverse right. questions. <laughs> yes, but they're they're like they're like on point. I'm moving my thing. Okay, I'm looking over there. Um, so we could couple things could be going on depending upon the age of the individual and the developmental age of the individual. So they could be mouthing objects because they're stuck in the oral phase of development which would be that this is how I'm learning my environment. My mouth has the most sensation that I get information from because there is a period of time in our lives that is exactly that, you know, when you're very small. <laughs> uh, but sometimes individuals with disabilities will kind of get stuck in that stage. So it could be that. Um, so consider that piece and just, you know, put that in your head and see if, if that's where that person is. And if that is where they are, then we just need to help work them out of that developmental stage, which may take time. Um, alternately, you could, well, you need to clean the objects most definitely, but what types of objects are they mouthing? Is it completely everything? Um, and when you're looking at the objects, so is it objects that are hard? Is it objects that are soft and chewy? What is the texture of the object? of the object and is there any consistency with the texture of which they are putting in their mouth. Um, if there isn't any consistency and it's just anything, try increasing the stimulation. So I've talked about that young lady who liked red hot sauce on stuff. If you can increase the oral input. So if you provide them with something super minty or super salty or, or um, spicy, that might give enough input orally to kind of stop for a period of time, the mouthing. So, and then you just kind of look at gradually like increasing the, the stimulation that you're giving through the food item or through that, that taste and see if that decreases the oral stim. Okay. And so kind of you're looking to spread out maybe the time between needing that stimulation so that they can engage in other exactly. activities. And then if, if you do that, you kind of end up, you can be able to phase it out completely because if you get enough stimulation and say it could end up being like cinnamon gum, like big red. So if they're chewing on big red and they're good and that as they're chewing on that gum, they're not mouthing on other items, they're getting the oral input they need. And then it's like switching out gum. Right. And then maybe okay. eating food. And so, yeah, you can eventually phase it out that way. Neat. Okay. Um, last one I see up here um, is recommendations for a child who every time we go on the playground goes straight to sand, dirt, or mulch and puts it all over her face and hair. Oh, yes. It's a lot of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. That's an interesting one in on her face and then in her hair. So, it, okay, so I, we're gonna see if I can ask more questions about this and if you can answer them. So when she's doing it, it brings the question up to me, is this like in front of her face? She's getting it on her face, I get that. But I wanna know is, is she putting it on her head? Can she see it? Is it a visual thing potentially that's coming down in front of her face? or is it just like tactily over her head? Um, and is, is that the thing? If it's um, visual and just in front of her face, then we, oh, hmm. She says rubbing on her face, she answered. She rubs it, oh good, right, thanks. Interactive, I love it. Okay, um, so she's rubbing it on her face. How old of a kiddo is this? I didn't say, two. Ooh, young, Voyage. Okay. young. All right, so I had an idea 
but I'm taking it back. I'm going to put it out there in case somebody has somebody older, but I was thinking about like that exfoliating face mask scuff, stuff that you use and she's rubbing it on the face. So that's what would make me think that the exfoliating stuff might work. But of course you're going to end up with some dry face if you do that too much and too often. Especially at that young of an age. Yeah. Yeah. And I would not do that with a two-year-old. I would do that with an older kiddo. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what to do about that one because if she's two, she's just kind of exploring all of that. And that's probably something she's going to work herself through. But I get from like a cleanliness standpoint, whatever, she's then completely covered in sand and mm. whatever else. Um, I'm going to have to think on that and see if I can get back to you. It's a, a better idea. Because right now I'm just thinking of protecting from her getting dirt everywhere. Yeah, like a hat that she could wear when she goes. Or... Exactly, which will probably not actually suit her needs. She's If she is getting out of it a sensation somehow, the hat's probably gonna irritate her. Um, if it's the visual piece, I was thinking you could try seeing how she would do with light strands in front of her face and seeing if it's the movement and the manipulation of light um, because if you're putting sand and or whatever in front of your face and getting it on you, if and you're outside, then you can kind of see like light would change. So it might be a visual type component, but it's probably tactile, uh, in which case I don't really have any good yeah. substitutions for that. Well, there's a couple of head. things like Stacy's adding a couple of ideas and we have a couple and it's great. It's a collaboration. I love this. But um, Stacy says, how about appropriate places? So kind of sort of allowing that, but kind of helping to guide where it is happening. So beach and sandbox and so forth. And she also thought maybe an hourglass thing, if it's the movement of the sand. Yeah. Um, Sarah said, what if she was able to rub the sand through a thin material or mesh or something, but maybe it's enclosed so it's not getting all over her? I guess we don't know enough about what the sensory, you know, seeking. Yeah, um, it's exactly very specific. Happening. We need to watch is, a little bit more carefully to know more. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very specific behavior that that yeah. seeing right there. So it, that maybe one definitely you, would require some trial and error. Right. And maybe they can use some of the information from the slides that you've shared and kind of use those to guide like, okay, when she's doing this, it seems, you know, see if it's hitting any of those mm -hmm. um, items that you mentioned for each of the um, categories there. Um, let's see, I think there was another one that came in. Um, a a five-year-old that burrows under sofa cushions, rugs, blankets, toys. Um, uh -huh. So proprioception, definitely. We're looking at proprioception. So depending upon whether you're in the home or the school environment, um, for a five-year-old, I like using something called a steamroller if you're at school. Um, and so what it is, is it's like a wooden contraption and it's kind of like a car wash. I usually refer to it as the car wash with, with students because there are four foam rollers, two on the top, two on the bottom. And on the side, there are, are adjustable bands so you can adjust the tightness that's happening depending upon the size of the child and how much input they need. But what they do is roll through the center of it and they can go back and forth. And I've had some kids that just kind of go in and hang tight for a while and then they'll come back out. Um, but that provides proprioceptive input on the bottom and on the top. And when you're looking at that burrowing thing, it usually has proprioception. Sometimes you can, it can be an avoiding behavior of different things. So don't discount like that. It could be all of that. Um, but if it is a sensation, sometimes as well, it is also trying to get rid of the visual. So if I'm sticking my head underneath that and I'm staying in there, it might be that piece as well. So consider both the visual and the probe, but I would go with proprioception first. Um, overall, proprioception is calming. It's a very calming sense. Um, so tap into that one first. And then if you're still seeing some stuff, try to use some of the visual pieces and see if there's a visual thing that's yeah. going on there too. The same person did mention that narrow spaces, but not really interested in like a weighted blanket or toy. So mm -hmm. it does seem like there's yeah. And if we just like enclosed spaces, just provide them with an enclosed space. Uh, you know, there, there have been people that kind of 
that's probably more of a visual thing and kind of controlling environment necessarily than the, the proprioception thing though. So play with those two senses and see which one you can, which one helps the most. Okay. Um, just had another one come on, which is child jumps out of seat, runs across the room to push on the wall and runs back. Mm. Seeking input, but not sure what to replace it with. Okay, so lots of questions pop up into my head. <laughs> um, definitely want to know, uh, considering, again, activity, looking at, is it consistent with when it's happening? Is it a task mm -hmm. demand or Avoidance. is it just random? And if it's a task demand, look at that, try to like give sensory stuff, also providing that reinforcement. I know we're very heavily focused on sensory here today, obviously, that's what we're talking about. Um, but don't forget positive reinforcement paired with difficult activities. So I'm just gonna put that disclaimer in there real quick. Um, but so look at that schedule. Then after that, think about the environment itself. Um, and I want you to use all of your senses when it's happening look at the walls. Are there reflective surfaces? How far is stuff from him? Sounds in the environment. Uh, like we have a school that doesn't have walls between classrooms. They're like office dividers. It's the weirdest school ever. But you can hear every other classroom. You can hear four classes in the pod. So think about sound. Are they hearing other things? Um, or is it just like enclosed and we're cool and pay attention to, to like um, the AC and the heat when they kick on as well. Um, some students will do that behavior when I need to figure out where I am in space related to a solid thing that is unmoving and I know it's unmoving. So they might go over into that and tap it and then they go back and they can sit back down and they know where they are. He might be going across and tapping it from a sound perspective because that tells him how far away from that wall he is. Um, so lots of questions to consider there to try to figure out what the source is, what the function is of that sensory input for him. So look for, is it a work avoidance thing? Is it that something's overstimulating in the environment? Is he a kiddo that is doing that but then also when he's walking down the hallway, he's the kid who's gonna bump into the kid in front of him and or behind him or bump into the wall. If he has all of that stuff going on, refer him for OT <laughs> because that is more of a motor planning and a position in space and a sensory processing overall thing. It's not a stim, it's, it's his body and he needs some actual intervention from a therapist. Great. Um, and she, as soon as you said the um, piece about um, sort of understanding where he is in the environment, she's like, totally, that's, that's absolutely it. Um, so to to help with that and help support that in the classroom, I would give him adaptive seating, give him something that requires motor action on his part. So I'm sitting in an adapted chair right now. There are ball chairs you can sit in. There's tea stools. Again, reach out to your OT that's in your school system, but look at one of those adaptive seating pieces because that's going to require more from his body. And that's, that input is going to help him know where he is in space. And you might yeah. see that, that extra piece decrease as that demand increases. Very cool. Any recommendations for how to replace the humming, which can be seen in older kids as interfering in classroom settings, I think, and yeah. those around them? So it's tough, right? Because if we have high school students, we definitely want them to fit in. And then here you go, you're in this gen ed class, you totally can handle the content and you are making some loud noises. Um, usually what I find helps is having them have those little earplugs um, because usually the humming is trying to block out all of those unpredictable sounds that happen. Somebody turning a piece of paper, like taking notes, like hearing a pencil on a piece of paper, all of those small noises um, and doing that, then you can get the little tiny ones and then people can't see them as much. Yeah. You can go developmentally appropriate and have somebody put earbuds in, um, which is again, fine, because it's gonna block out some of that extraneous sound, but of course we would need to, you know, clear that with everybody and just kind of make that a note, but that can help and 
that would be a suggestion. Otherwise using headphones and letting them have like calming noises and sounds and whether it be music or ocean playing or something like that, you play with the different things because for each individual person, it's different. Yeah, a little trial and error to sort of figure out what, what works. So, yeah. Yeah. okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through. And I know we're kind of closing in on the hour here. And I wanted to just take a few minutes again to tell you, thank you, Gina. I mean, um, just the wonderful one-on-one uh, -on -one answering questions. I'm glad we had a lot of time for that. And um, we actually have next week's Lunch and Learn. I'm gonna drop that quickly into the chat um, so that folks can go out and get registered for that. We're gonna be talking about cultivating inclusion next week. Um, and I do have a couple more um, questions rolling in right here at the end. Are you good, Gina, for another yep. couple? Okay. Um, this is another two-year-old with a sock fetish. Hmm. Always has to have a sock in his hand. Doesn't matter whose sock or what it looks like, but needs a sock. No functional play because the sock is keeping him from playing with his hands. Hmm. Um, he's just walking around happy with the sock. Okay. So... I think questions that come up in my head are, are we flapping the sock? Or are we just playing with it? Are we putting our hand in it or are we just holding it? No flapping, just holding. Just holding it, okay. Let them hold the sock. Maybe it's like a grip, like a, <laughs> a hard grip. I don't know. Grip, I I guess. To... Okay, I so, know. so my first thing is yeah, let them hold it, but say you're working with this kiddo and you need them to actually start like, you know, doing something. I forget the age. Did we say two? I think she said two. And I think that that's the issue is more that it's like, I only want to do this. I don't want to engage in any other play that would help me learn things. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so what I would do, so we have that is a tactile input would be my first thought. Um, and it's something that's smooth and soft. So I would give him, see if we can put like something smooth or soft, like or soft on his lap. So maybe take a sock and fill it with um, like beans and rice or whatever, like something that's a little bit heavier and like make it like uh, around his waist, like a belt so that it's there, it's always there. He can put his hand on it. And so when you want to have him do an activity, you can have him and I would start with hands on with him, like rubbing the sock thing that's around his waist and then putting hand over hand to put it on the surface, like up top and actually give him whatever else you're trying to do, whether it be crayons or buttons or whatever, um, whatever thing you want him to do and just reinforce, positively reinforce him doing something else and then bring his hands back down so that he can feel that soft sensation. Try to work him out of it like that. Give it to him and take it away and positively reinforce him when he does engage in something else. Yeah, great ideas. Um, online classroom, five-year-old would attend to songs, but not to instructions. I use play sand Play-Doh to get her to stay seated, but she is engrossed with that instead of the actual screen, I guess, where the learning is taking place. Okay, so what age did online. you Five. Five, okay. So at home, so has their own sand at home, I'm guessing. So what I'm hearing is that we have a five-year-old kid trying to engage in the learning, not doing anything unless it's sing-songy. And then we have our kinetic sand situation going on over here. Is that what that said? Yeah, I think that maybe it's, I mean, I'm thinking and correct me if I'm wrong, Kayla, but it sounds like maybe the play sand and play-doh might be part of the instruction to kind of keep people, the kids and young kids engaged. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm reading. Okay. So what I think of is it's, it's great to have a fidget or something else like tapping into that tactile to increase alertness and actually pay attention. Um, so at baseline, that's great. And what I'm wondering is so the engagement is different for individuals with autism. And I, I don't know your background, whether you're a gen ed teacher, a special ed teacher, if this is like a more of a significant student or, or not, because um, all of those things come into play. But individuals with autism don't necessarily give us the same output as others. So looking at that, I would say, 
if they're engaging with whatever the sand is, what's the output you're asking for them? Because they might be focused on this, but completely hearing everything you're saying and just not giving you the same visual output that you're used to seeing um, from a neurotypical five-year-old. So that would be kind of my question. Um, it's just, I wonder what's happening there. They might have it. So look at different methods for output. Um, alternatively, if output is not an issue and it just is that they're really focused on this, I'm hoping that there's some adult there that can help with the first then kind of situation to say, like you can play with this while we're engaging in the lesson. And then I'm gonna take this away because I need you to answer the question or to whatever. Um, if it's an output thing, I would look at using something like board makers, symbol sticks or Google photos or whatever to try to get the, a visual answer from them instead of an auditory answer for whatever content you're working on. Yeah, I, I guess that's the question is, you know, what kind of response are you looking for? So I know you said, um, Michaela says she's not responding to questions. So if she's just sort of lost in playing with the sand, um, she said, first then, yeah. maybe. Yeah, try the first like that. then. And I don't know if this, this child is typically verbal, um, but you can always support them using the visual strategies. And I know it's weird and virtual world. Um, and I am not, I don't know what kind of format you're using, whether it's Schoology or Google or whatever, because all those things come into play too. Um, but if there's a way to give her a visual response, so even if it would be like you're emailing her parents ahead of time, and then they have like a choice board and she can point to different answers or somehow indicate that instead of doing the verbal that might help. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do this last question and then I think we're gonna be right at our time. But um, the question kind of is a good wrap up one because it's managing strategies in the classroom. So say for example, you know, the drumming really works to meet the need of one child, but may there may be another person in the, the room that it doesn't work so well for. So how do you kind of manage how to meet those sensory needs without complicating someone else's sensory needs? Yeah, so I'm gonna go broad with this question because you're right, it's a great wrap up. So yeah, so I might need to drum and auditory might drive this person over here absolutely crazy. <laughs> so that, that's right. a problem. Um, in a classroom that might be a special education setting classroom, usually we have more than one person working. So sometimes an option is that one student get removed from the room to either go engage in the behavior that they need or to be outside of the classroom when another student is engaging in their behavior. It's an option. It's not an option everywhere. Um, if you are in a classroom where it's just one adult and you've got this one that needs to drum and this one that drives crazy, then you let this person drum over here and do their thing on a schedule and let this person over here have some music or some headphones or something at a similar time. So I'm blocking out that noise and I'm getting what I need to do. Um, so that's some options as far as how to handle that because we all have stuff we need, right? So one of the things that I, I, I'm so glad that you're wrapping it up this way. Um, one of the things to consider is if you're in a general education classroom or you are in a home setting and you have multiple children, one of which needs this and the other ones don't, let them all explore it because they are only going to care as long as it does something for them. So it's not a problem to say, okay, so-and-so is doing this right now. Oh, you want to do that too? Yeah, go ahead. It's your turn now. Enjoy. And then get it back to who needs it. And so that usually at baseline, will like people will try it out and they think it's cool. And then they just ignore it because if they don't need it and it's not doing anything for them, it's done. Um, the other thing that I like to do is have conversations about fair, not equal. And um, there's an example that somebody gave to me that I'm going to give out to you because I really like it. And it's a teacher uh, went into a classroom one day and had a dollar bill. And so she walked up to the front of the room and she said, okay, I'm going to put this dollar bill right up here. And if you can come and you can take it, it's yours, you know, enjoy. And so the student's like, oh my gosh, like, I want to try this. Let's go. And so she goes up to the top of the board and she puts the dollar bill up on the, the wall, but the student can't get to it because it's too short. But there's a student standing next to him that's taller and that student gets the dollar. 
And the shorter student says, well, hey, that's not fair. Like you put it where I couldn't reach it. And she's like, oh, okay, all right, hold on. So it gives that other student a step stool to stand on and then puts the dollar up and then both students reach for it and both students get a dollar. And they're like, oh, okay, now this is fair. And she's like, well, wait a minute, that's not fair because you have a stool and he doesn't. Yeah, but he doesn't need it. And so that's an example for like describing to a class and kind of going through with the class, like, yeah, you're right. So we're gonna have different things in here. It's fair, but it's not gonna be equal. You might not get the same thing that somebody else does, but you're gonna get what you need. And that's kind of how I look at sensory. You, everybody has their own system and what works for them. And we provide that for what that person needs to be able to access their education or their life. That's a great conclusion to this. this that was perfect. So awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us today um, on the Lunch and Learn. And again, Gina, thank you. We will have the slides and a recording of today's session posted on the archives page. And don't forget to go register for next week's Lunch and Learn so we can talk some about inclusion. And um, just hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.